part of the Press Play Podcast Network. Hey everybody, it's your host, Don Mike Mendoza of Producing While Asian. Welcome to today's episode. Today we sit down with Giselle Tongi, a co-producer of the Broadway Tony Award-nominated musical Here Lies Love, as well as the executive director of Phil M Arts based in Los Angeles. She's not only a good friend, but she's also an amazing artist and somebody who started in modeling and is a, the epitome of the example of going from one art to the next and being somebody who is truly multifaceted and also is somebody who has a journey that I feel a lot of people could relate to. So I'm not going to give too much away, so I'd like you to just get right into the conversation, settle in, and enjoy today's conversation on Producing While Asian. Well, hi, G. It's so good to see you. Welcome to Producing While Asian. Hi, Don Mike. I miss you, and I'm so glad to finally be on your show. I know we've been trying to do this for a minute, but Yeah, I think the last time I had an eye infection, so I couldn't. But thank you for being patient and following up. Of course, no worries. And I'm glad that we can like sit and have a conversation because the last time I saw you in person was like the craziness of closing and we were like crying and it was not (laughs) it's like a mess, but all good. And we'll, we'll get into that a little later. But I'm really excited that you're here because it's just this show is just here to showcase people that I'm connected to who have something to say and have made an impact on the community that they're part of and the community we're part of together. And just to get people to hear your story for those that might not already know you, we're just going to start there. So can you tell our audience just a little bit about yourself and the arts and what got you into this industry and kind of what landed you here today as a part of Phil M Arts? Yeah. So, I mean, the trajectory of my career really started when I got discovered. I got discovered. I was at a nightclub in the Philippines called Faces. (laughs) And I was a young model. I was 16 at the time. And a director came up to me saying, I just finished my directing course at NYU. And I'm directing a film about my mother. And I'd love for you to consider being part of it. And initially I was like, I'm a model. I don't want to be an actor. (laughs) And prior to that, I had no experience, no training whatsoever, except for, you know, school plays here and there. And so initially I said, no, I'm a model. (laughs) But I'm so glad um, the person I was speaking to knocked some sense into me. And this person continues to be my mentor till till this day. And his name is Eric Kizon. And so Eric Kizon brought me to Regal Films to do a screen test for Mother Lily, who is the matriarch of Regal Films. And I, on the spot, got offered a 16-picture four-year contract to Mm -hmm. star in films. I had never done any film work. I was only doing like hosting here and there. I started hosting for a show called Mad Martin After Dark, which was with Martin Yvera. So really, I got discovered in the Philippines at a discotheque called Faces. And (laughs) yeah, and, and from there, you know, I did a lot of films and television when I was a teenager. So I can, I can say that, you know, my training was really on the set. And when I turned, when I was about to turn 21 in the year 2000, I'm dating myself, but I really wanted to legitimize my craft. And so that's when I said, you know what, I'm going to go to New York City and I'm going to go to acting school because I had never gone to school to be an actor. And so I ended up going and moving to New York City at the age of 21, and I left all my commitments in Manila. I was doing endorsements, film, television. I was working with Viacom at Singapore for MTV, and I just said, you know what? I want to study. I really, I love acting, and I love the theater, so I'm going to go to school to to discover what it means to really understand the craft. So I ended up going to Lee Strasberg Theater Institute. I took their two-year course. During this time, 9-11 happened. But luckily, I got signed to an agency that 
was sending me out for a lot of soap operas because, you know, the Filipino style of acting is very much soap opera style. But then when I graduated, I really wanted to go to L.A. And so I moved here to L.A. in 2003. And then I was auditioning for a couple of years. I never really booked anything significant because I would go into casting and they would say, oh, the Latino casting was yesterday. And I'm like, no, I'm here for the Asian casting. So, you know, when I look in the mirror, I see a Filipina. But when people see me, they're like, yeah, are you Brazilian? Are you Latina? Whoa. Um, so, you know, there's a bit of a identity issue with the way I I see myself and the the way the that people see me. But luckily, I had an opportunity to go back to Manila every time there was some projects. So I still got to act, even though I was never really booking in America. And come 2005, I got married, then I shortly became a mother. And then I stopped altogether and then went back to school. And that's when I really saw the power of being able to be a decision maker and create roles for people to represent an entire community. So in college, I did a 16 minute short film and I had a hundred people on the set at UCLA and it was an amazing experience. And as soon as I graduated college with a communications degree and a theater and film, television and digital art minor, I went back to the Philippines to produce my first travel documentary, which I wrote, I produced, I hosted, I held the the the, the lights for, like we did everything, but right. I was able to sell that to GMA Pinoy International. It was called the Balikbayan Project with the Boscos, the Bosco family, Dante Bosco and his siblings. That's when I knew that, you know, I really wanted to go to school to understand what it means to be a producer. Got it. Well, that's an incredible journey. Like, I, I love yeah. that you, that you could, like hug both countries at the same time. And, you know, because I feel like there's a lot of folks that if they leave one place, they only stay where they go or they, you know, they they kind of silo themselves off. And I think like we have something in common where we do a lot of things at once, you know, like a almost like one man band type deal. Like you act, you produce, you, you know, do all the things and organize and you have a communications degree as well. And so, it, it, but I feel like that's just something that is required now. Like you have to be able to move and 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 grow and change and just be adaptable because you never know like i mean you never know when there's going to be a global pandemic and you can't act and can't do things or you know when your job will change or if a country might implode in november and you have to change countries again like you don't know <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot i used so to that's... have options don mike yes totally and you know i i did notice that, that you did get a degree later on and so it's really cool to know what it was in and terms of theater and communication. So very cool. And then you're you're in LA and you're with your family. And now you have a college age daughter who's going off to school. And I think they want to study in the arts as well, right? Yeah. So I do have a non-binary child and, you know, I'm learning every day what that means and what that means to them, especially with the pronouns. And it's interesting because, you know, we live in a world where there is language now for people to identify with that I never had when I was growing up, right? But I think the arts is a significant part of my family's life. As early as I can remember, we've been going to the theater. And I've been lucky that way because when I moved back to the Philippines after graduating college, two years later, I thought I was going to be in the Philippines for good, right? Because I wanted my kids to learn Tagalog. That was important to me. But then there was an opportunity back in L.A., a local television station at the time, KSCI, was looking for a host producer. And so because of that opportunity, I got to go back to L.A. in 2014 after moving there with 70 Balikbayan boxes, thinking that was going to be it, right, with the two kids and my husband, only to find out that there was this opportunity for me back in L.A. And when I returned back to L.A., I wore a different hat. I was hosting a daily talk show called Kababayan Today. And because of it, 
I got press invites to all the theater that came to LA. And of course, my plus one was this little kid that got to experience what it was like to watch all of this amazing theater and also to be in a theater company, a, a children's theater company, where there weren't many males in the in in the production. So my kid has been able to play traditional male roles like Quasimodo and Bert from Mary Poppins. And so this idea of gender, especially in the theater, is so fluid because it's a hat you put on and then you yeah. take off, right? So mm -hmm. it's interesting how the theater has really formed my children's identity. And so that's why I see how important it is. Yeah. And that's amazing. And so as, you know, having been in the industry for so long, you know, what are your hopes for your, your child? For my kid? Yeah, for, yeah, kid. for my kid. It's um, hard to venture into this world that we know so well. You're coming at it from I, both somebody who's in the industry and also a mother now just being like, well, you know, um, what yeah, have you well, imparted upon them? So Don, Mike, I didn't take the traditional education route, right? I had a very busy career prior to going back to school. I never even graduated high school, believe it or not. I, I didn't, you know, I went the community college route. And now that my kid is off to college, I want to see them pursue whatever they want in, in, in school. And, you know, theater was something that they considered. They got into NYU. It was part of our plan, but then the exorbitant cost of college out of state is just a reality that I think we should talk more about because it's ridiculous that NYU charges 93,000 a year, a year. Yeah. Yeah. That's like four years. That's like $400,000. So, you know, as much as we wanted to do that, there was no aid offer. And so they applied to many colleges and they decided to go to UC Berkeley where they're going to be taking interdisciplinary studies with this idea of theater and education, right? And yeah. psychology. So my kid wants to be a drama therapist, which I think is really exciting, but yeah. they can still sing their face off. <laughs> I saw and, those videos of Into the Woods. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, I'm I'm just so proud of them to be able to, understand that the arts and theater and performance will always be there but college is really a time to explore other avenues and as much as I wanted to take theater in college which I did I minored in it I knew that to have a career outside of the arts was also a way to sustain a life right so I'm excited and and also I'm a little sad because that's also something that we don't talk about is as humans, our children evolve and they go out into the world, but we have to evolve too to be able to let go and give yeah. them and trust, trust that the tools that we have instilled in them all throughout their 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 growing up years is going to take them to where they want to go. So I am excited, but I'm sad at the same time because I'm going to miss my baby. But I know that, you know, this is the natural progression. But I would love to see a musical about, you know, a mother's plight when she becomes an empty nester. I think that's really interesting because that's mm -hmm. what I'm going through. And also, Don Mike, a lot of ideas that I brought to my children at a young age topics that you know we don't talk to kids about suicide being gay being a lesbian like all of these things that as filipinos we don't really have conversations about i was able to have because we would watch fun home and you know from yeah, yeah so it, it has given my family a language to see the world through that's beautiful. I really love that. So now you still act. Obviously, you were in Mix Mix, right? There I, I moonlight here that. and there. It's a first <laughs> love that I, I I love acting. I think, you know, it's the it's a way to showcase humanity at its at its visceral level because it's it's really human emotion and connection. And Mix Mix was a great 
time, but it was also a lot of time. So props to all people that are so dedicated to theater that that is the only thing they're pursuing. Mm -hmm. People in the theater are the hardest working people. I mean, uh, truly. And I saw that with this opportunity with Here Lies Love of, of their athletes, right? I mean, yeah. it takes yeah. so much. And when you're working in a production, especially if you're on stage, you can't like, it has to be a completely focused endeavor. And right. I'm so used to like, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I'm doing this. So to park everything else I was doing to focus on creating this art with these amazing artists was a luxury. But at the same time, it was so nerve wracking because I knew that, you know, I had to park everything else that I was doing aside. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's especially yeah, diving into characters and like, you know, being oh, it's so much work. Yeah. And being in a different world for several hours, whether it's rehearsal or the show itself, you know, it take it, it does take a toll because like you have to go there, right? You have to be live in that world and feel their feelings. And, you know, and that so I, I, I do love that, I, you know, like you, I, I'm a producer that also performs as well. And I like to remind myself just like. I do it because I'm trying to, I, I want to keep it in my system, right? You don't want to completely depart from acting. And so, so given that, like with you, like you come into producing, you know, with your own series, but then also recently with Broadway's Here Lies Love, which is how we met. And so talk to me about kind of the balancing of those two worlds, right? Like keeping the arts alive in yourself, but then also supporting the arts and creating and supporting opportunities for, for our community and, and also underrepresented voices, what led you into Here Lies Love and, and pursuing that? Yeah, so I, I really attribute this opportunity to Jose Antonio Vargas, who was one of the lead producers. He called me to tell me about the show. And I had seen a production, not in New York at the public, but in Seattle, mm -hmm. because my friend Melody was in it. So I flew to Seattle to see that show. And... I had known of the material and I, I mean, funny enough, I remember as a child during People Power, being on the streets with my mother, uh, rallying, buying the, the, the yellow t-shirt on the side of the road. And mm -hmm. so it was, it was something that I really connected with. And so when Jose had asked me if I could meet with Diana Demina, who was one of the other producers to come on board, initially I said, no, I'm, I said, I'm just a community organizer. Like I, and, and a producer, like I felt I diminished myself because I didn't think that Broadway was something I could be a part of. And that's the truth because how often does an opportunity like that happen, right? But then when Diana said, you know, this is an, uh, we need to make sure that it is, it, this comes from an authentic place and representation isn't just about who's on stage. It's about who's seeing the shows. And, mm -hmm. and that was the biggest challenge for me is how could I use my voice to bring representation from the community standpoint? Mm -hmm. And so vacillating between leave, living in L.A., going to New York, m making sure to get the community to understand the significance, the culture, cultural and historical significance of this production at a time also when BBM just got elected, felt like, you know, the right time to do the work. And so I took it as a challenge. And, you know, it was the most amazing summer of my life. When I think about my life on my tomb tombstone, I I'm not going to write here lies love, but <laughs> I know in my heart that, you know, having been able to experience that has been the highlight of my career. Yeah, I agree. It was, it was an incredible year. And that summer was like, I still think back on it and I'm like, that really happened. Like we really did that. And like, came together and made that possible and so and we just like what dj chair says like cherish the love we just we just opened the door like we opened the door to to what's to come after us so and here lies love is like i keep saying on on here here lies love is not over yet 
Like, you know, we just have to keep our eyes and ears open to what, what will happen in the future. So, but that's great. Hello, Brooks here with the Books with Brooks monthly book club podcast. Here's how Books with Brooks works. We read one book a month and then we talk about it. Classics like Stephen King's The Shining, debut novels like We Are the Brennans by Tracy Lang, and tons of other compelling, life-changing stories, one book and one month at a time. So come read along with us and then listen in. Hey, this is JD from the Hyman Podcast, a place to have hard conversations revolving around the overall human experience. We tackle topics such as racism, the American justice system, and even headlining news such as the Alex Murdoch saga. This season, we're going to continue to tackle more hard-hitting topics, and I'm excited to take you on that journey. The Hyman Podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. The Hyman Podcast is produced in conjunction with the Hyman brand and is part of the Press Play Podcast Network. Hi, everyone. I'm Giselle Tongi, and you're listening to Producing While Asian. So would you say then, having done that experience, like, you know, I ask all my guests on a scale of one to 10, one being not at all, 10 being I'm a producer, so scale of one to producer, where do you sit nowadays? And that, of course, that answer will change over the course of your life. But, you know, at this moment in time, where do you think you are on that scale and why? Yeah, so prior to being part of Here Lies Love, I would have said, you know, I'm I'm a two, I'm a three, because, you know, I... I rally community to make something out of mm-hmm. barely nothing, right? I'm used to producing with not a lot of resources, but Here Lies Love taught me that we should never diminish our capability given an opportunity. So I would say, you know, I've still a lot to learn. I still don't have the connections to raise millions of dollars, but I surprised myself because I was able to become a co-producer and raise this money that I never in my wildest dreams thought I could do. And so, you know, I would say I'm a six. I'm still a baby. I have so much to learn, but obviously access to unlimited funding would totally bring me to a 10. Right. Like it's, that's the one thing I'm like, if people, if every person I asked said, yes, I would bring in like $10 million to hear less love, but you know, it's, but asking someone for $50,000, is a big ask or more, you know, at that point. And so, yeah, I, I'm right there with you. I mean, like it was also my first time and it was, you know, seeing that number in front of your face and like knowing that you're like responsible for bringing in that much money is like intimidating. You're like, man, like where, like where are these people that I know? And even the people that you know, that probably are in that income bracket might not be able to, to give it. So I think I, you know, I don't, I'm sure you could agree. Like I learned the power of referral in that exercise of like, if that person said no, they were like, well, I know two other people that might, and just like going down that journey, I feel like, you know, we met people that we would have never spoken to had we not gone through this exercise. And Laura describes it it was like a baptism by fire. It was just like, well, here's this crap ton of money you need to find and go. (laughs) There is no, no real guideline, you know? Yeah. And I think, you know, the term producer is so, so many things that people don't recognize as well right Mm -hmm. the the sweat equity that goes into it but really it's it's also overcoming a lot of cultural stigma in the filipino community to ask for money right I, i think that was the biggest lesson for me is you know people that you think may not have the capacity to support theater are just waiting in the wings Right. And and a prime example of that is DJ Cherish the Love. I had met DJ Cherish. And when I brought this to her, she's like, huh, that's interesting. Let me get back to you. And then went all in as a mm-hmm. co-producer. So it, it's just amazing to me that there are people out there that understand the value of what it means to make art at this level. I will say, though, when I think about what we had to do, I still am like in disbelief because 
that amount of money can only last you how many months on Broadway, you know, and it, it is truly an economic endeavor. Mm -hmm. We essentially each raised almost one week's worth of operating costs. And that's like, you know, fascinating when you think about it. And so it kind of brings up another topic. And like, I'd love to know your opinion on it. It's like the like the accessibility of becoming a, a part of the Broadway producing community. Like it's very, you know, it's person gatekeeping. It's the the amounts of money that you have to find. And like, you know, there there's a reason why our community isn't just, oh, we do this because like we don't have that access. So kind of what are your thoughts on that? And, you know, do you think we were able to move the needle a little bit in terms of like cracking that opportunity open for other people of color and communities of color that want to do that? And do you think the system we had could still change more or do you think it's what we need, you know? Yeah, no, I I, I think the barriers to creating art at the Broadway level is definitely exclusionary, without a doubt. Even though we were already had our foot in the door, there were still multiple challenges presented every day, just because when you've never done anything or have never been given an opportunity to do something and you're doing it for the first time, one, it's historic. But two, the challenges that that the the that are ahead of you are just unfathomable, right? And th there's a reason why you know there are barely any Filipinos on Broadway, uh, yeah. on a producing level. But the mm -hmm. fact the 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 humility and the generosity of our lead producers to bring so many Filipino co-producers is also a statement to the entire Broadway community that things have to change. So what does it take for people to go to bat for an entire community? And I, I, I truly want to acknowledge Diana Demena, Patrick Catullo, you know, and Kevin O'Connor for, for, for the generosity that we were given to be able to enter that space. Mm -hmm. Right. It, and it, while it's important for us to be there, it also... You know, the credit, like you're saying, goes to our allies, like the ones who already kind of have that access and could pry open that door to let us come through, you know, because, you know, if it wasn't for them and collaborating with our, you know, our other two leads with Clint and Ramos and with Jose, you know, there wouldn't be 22 more Filipino producers that came through that door, you know, to help make this happen. So, yeah, I, I think, I mean, is there still a lot of work to do? Absolutely. Like, you know, should... Should it always be $500,000 to be a co-producer? Absolutely not. Like, I think there needs to be like different ways of coming in at that point. While money is important, you know, maybe there's a different way and a different amount that ha that comes into play, you know, and it's more about bringing equity rather than like, you know, oh, wow, you know, a bunch of rich people, you know, like that, like what, what is it that's going to be different in the future that makes it more accessible and equitable for all people to be part of it because you know it, it kind of goes down the line because we won't see other stories that represent other communities if those voices aren't in the decision making room you know and they and can't and then if those voices aren't asking the questions about like 100%. well what a, so yeah it's it's really cool and tell me a little bit about the more more of a fun question like give me your like top three moments in the Here Lies Love process that like, you were like, wow, like I'm here right now, this is happening. Like, whoa, you know, like mind blowing, like my like life changing moments. Like I'm sure there were many, but what are your kind of top three? None of them better than the other, just three, three moments that, you know, kind of were moving for you. Yeah, I mean, I think when we had to do an activation for Philippine Fest, Mm -hmm. And it was a Filipino festival in Times Square. There was a little stage. I don't know if it was even a stage. It was just like, right. you know, compared to the stage where we were at. And, and we brought the Filipino artists on that stage. I remember the smell of barbecue mm -hmm. wafting in our face because it was right next to the stage. And I was like, this is unreal. We have top tier caliber artists that are 
all in, willing to do this because of their heritage and their love for community. And I thought that that was so special to see the dedication of what it means to be Filipino from these artists, you know, performing next to the the barbecue yeah. smoke. I mean, it was, <laughs> to me, that was like a moment that I had to step back to say, you know what, there, this is so symbolic because <laughs> right. look huh. how far we've all come, right? Yeah. But at the same time, even though we've come so far, we still understand what this moment means. Yes. So it's that was really... performed by the barbecue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that was really, really special to me. Um, mm -hmm. the, the second one was obviously opening night because my children were there. My best friend was there. My friend from Manila flew in for it. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's just that surreal moment in your life where you can't believe that you're a part of something like this, like, you know, you only see it in the movies. And then all of a sudden, wow, I get to, and there was so many Filipinianas and people dressed in traditional garb that, you know, taking up space. And I yeah. loved that. I loved, I loved how we all turned up and, and showcased our culture. Mm -hmm. And even Diana Damina was wearing um, a Filipino designer, Mark yeah. Buckburner. So I thought it was like, so special. Um, and then, you know, I will say another moment was being with my co-producers on the floor, holding each other and crying at that last show. That last show was really, really, I can't even put to words the feelings because I still have not processed the grief. I have, I have so much love for, for the show and the people that have come together to make this art that I'm still, it still makes, it puts a lump in my throat to think of what could have been. But at the same time, also celebrating the fact that we got there. We did it. Yeah, we did it, man. Like we, you know, we made him, we made a mark. We brought a freaking jeepney onto Broadway. Like we, you know, we made it real Filipino. So like, yeah, it's, it's sad. It's, it's both. It's sad and it's happy. It's like, you know, we're I'm so glad we did what we did. Do we all wish it lasted longer? Of course. But somebody said, I, I think it was, it might've been Leia. It was like, all shows have to close at some point. And so ours was just much sooner. But the thing is, the material is not gone. It's not like it's never going to happen again. Like, so will it happen like that again? No. But will it happen again? Absolutely. Where? I don't know. Like, I, I've heard the rumblings, but, you know, I don't want to speak out of turn on this podcast. But like, that it's not gone forever. So yeah, I, I, I agree with you with that third moment. Like, that was very special. And just like, I've never been so like not attached like i'm attached to a lot of things but it's like we were all collectively so into this and so like dedicated and fought for it like all the way up to the end and like you know i think the crying was partly sad but mostly about like whoa like you know you look back at all the stuff we did like all the things that went into it and we did it and like the fact that the audience finished the show and not Moses was really fun. <laughs> it was like, that's how much they loved the show. Like everybody knew the the words and like part of it too in that room. And just something that happened every time I saw the show is that if we're going to go back to the topic of representation, kind of what you mentioned earlier about casting, you know, it's like to see all the shades of Filipino on one stage you know, and I think it goes back to your moment of like, wow, people think I look Latinx or whatever, you know, it's like, no, I look Filipino. Look at, the, we showed them. We're like, look at this show. Like, look at all these people. Like you, you don't, not one person looks Filipino. Like it's all different, you know? And, and, you know, those are just three, but there's so many more, so many more. And man, what memories we were able to, create together when the documentary comes out one day we'll all be on there talking about it <laughs> fingers crossed so given that you know your your life outside of here lies love you are part of philam arts tell us about that and and creating philam arts and being part of that movement and kind of what it is it what is the work that you guys do 
in on the West Coast? And because I know you also help support events on the East Coast, but kind of what is the main chunk of the mission for Film Arts? Yeah, so when I moved to Los Angeles in 2003, I shortly met some stakeholders of the organization. I did not found this organization. This was founded by the community 30 years ago when the Festival of Philippine Arts and Culture was born out of the Department of Cultural Affairs in Los Angeles. And every year they held an annual festival that brought artists and community together to represent our Filipino heritage. I am simply the next generation taking over the reins. And because I had volunteered for the organization in multiple capacities as a host, as a volunteer, I got invited to join the board before the 25th anniversary. And I was on the board for a short period and did whatever I could to really figure out a way to bring more resources to the artist community that are Filipino here in the West Coast. And then before I knew it, the leadership was transitioning out and there was an opportunity for me to step in, which I did. And coincidentally, the first activation we did under my helm was to support East West Players Mamma Mia because Joan Mm -hmm. Anadilla was the lead playing Donna. And so... In my capacity, we just rallied people to make sure to go to the theater and see the show and support it. And so the turnout was great. And that led one thing to another. Then the pandemic happened. And another mentor of mine said, maybe you should consider taking your master's in nonprofit management. And so for two years in the pandemic, I spent time really thinking about what it means to bring access and resources to a Filipino American community in the arts. I learned how to grant write, I learned how to administer grants, how to create you know, logic models for programs, and to work with a board of directors to further a mission. And so the mission really of Philam Arts is to support Filipino artists and culture bearers for celebration, Mm -hmm. representation, and education. Uh, Because I see the value of theater and arts as an educational tool because my family is a a product of that. So I became executive director soon after I graduated in 2001. And since then, I've been producing the Festival of Philippine Arts and Culture that brings, brings together thousands of community members to celebrate a one-day event in Los Angeles, and it is my job to raise money through grants, through government agencies, and and bring this to the community. So it's something I'm really passionate about, but the reality is it's only my part-time job, which I wish it was my full-time job so that I could just be thinking about how to raise money for artists in the West Coast that are Filipino. But I also work, I have a day job. I have a marketing and branding agency called 7107 Media, where I have clients like Island Pacific Grocery Store to really bring community and culture together, but this way in like a culinary way, right? So Mm -hmm. I'm finding so much purpose in my work. And I recently posted about this on my Facebook. They said that If you love what you do, you'll never have to work a day in your life. And so, yes, I work a lot, but it's work that is deeply purposeful to me. So I I really enjoy being able to do it. And and Don Mike, as you know, you produce events. It is hard. It is, you know, trying to rally people to support it, get the artists like it is. It is a lot of work. But because we love what we do, it doesn't feel like it. Right. And it's like, I, I love seeing the through line in all of your work and kind of in everything that you're doing, right. It all stems back to community. Like you, you know, I'm, you're working with Philam Arts, your, your marketing company that you have, you know, becoming a co-producer on Realize love and you know all of kind of just the things that you do every day you live it you breathe it and like that's you know it's really important and I, I 
I really appreciate when you can see somebody's full trajectory, right? And like know that they like your personal mission in life is that word community and creating that, which is, you know, why you're the community liaison of Here Lies Love. You are community. Giselle Tong Tongi is is that person. <laughs> and so I love that. And when how often or I know it's once a year, when does the arts festival happen? Yeah, so this year's festival is our 30th year, which is really exciting. And it takes place this year on September 14, a Saturday. We have an amazing lineup. Joe Bataan is our headliner. Ruby Ibarra is going to curate the lineup. Our friend Vince Rodriguez is slated to be at the festival. And Uh, VST and company are going to be performing. So it is a multi-generational kind of programming, not just for one kind of demographic, right? Because we've seen in the past that multi-generations of Filipinos turn out to the festival. So we've got program, we've got a children's pavilion, we've got an ancestral pavilion where we're working with our next generation of culture bearers to really represent and educate people on Filipino culture through textiles, martial arts, even ancient Philippine script called Baybayin. Like there are multiple things that are happening at the festival. So there's something for everybody. That's amazing. Maybe I'll make it my birthday trip. My birthday's on the 15th. Please! Oh, come! <laughs> come, Because Vin- Vincent's supposed to come to Pittsburgh that next week, so I'll just, like, come pick him up. I'll be like, all right, let's go. We're going to go to Philam Arts, and then we're going to fly to Pittsburgh. <laughs> yes! Maybe you can host on stage, too. That would be I'd great. That. Let me yes. know. Yes! Yes, I, I will. So, that's cool. I love that, because I do want to check it out and, and see, you know, all the things you do, like, the hard work you put into it. But that's awesome. I love that it lines up on my birthday weekend. I'm uh... Yes, come to LA. And and truly, you know, I, I don't do this alone. As you know, it takes so many people to be able to turn out a successful event. It's not just me. There's so many people. We have a festival director, Giovanni Ortega, uh, a, a co-director that everybody's doing the work and so many volunteers. We are excited to announce that we are joining the Press Play Podcast Network. The Krypton Report podcast is dedicated to all things Superman, Supergirl, and the planet Krypton. We discuss movies, TV, game, comics, and all things DC. So join me, Tyler, with my co-host James and Jania. So join us as we explore DC's multiverse. Look for a Krypton Report on all social media platforms. Hi, everyone. I'm Giselle Tongi, and you're listening to Producing While Asian. The final part of our conversation. So I know we touched a little bit on it when we talked about your family. But, you know, for anybody that's out there listening, that's like, you know, I really want to get into not-for-profit arts management or produce one day or, you know, are somebody who's an actor who's thinking about jumping over or even it's like somebody... Because people in the Philippines do listen to this podcast, surprisingly. So like, if anybody's in the Philippines, that's like, oh, I want to jump over to the States. Kind of what's, you know, kind of like a few tidbits of advice you could leave for them based on your experience. Kind of something you wish somebody told you in your time. A word of advice. You know, it's all about collaborating. I think it's important as artists that we collaborate with as many artists as possible because it it, it only widens our perspective on what we're trying to accomplish. I believe that it's so important that, you know, we we listen, but at the same time, we build together because... And I'm sorry, that's my that's my train. <laughs> but yeah, I, I I think it's it, it really has to come from a point of, you know, how can we work together for the greater good? Finding your tribe is important. I mean, Don Mike, you work a lot with Laura. You found your tribe, right? You guys are producing stuff all the time together. And I think that that's in any but anybody that wants to get into producing. It's so important that you find the people that you trust that are on the same wavelength, that are willing to collaborate to make something special happen. Yeah, absolutely. Because it it all boils down to 
just that. Like, can you get along? <laughs> it's like, that's, that's the number one thing. It's like, you have to like the people you work with and, you know, be able to compliment each other in whatever way that may be, because it's, it, it takes team, it takes a team and you have to work together and, you know, and starting with kind of how you all vibe is kind of the first part. And, um, yeah, and, and the rest comes with, with it, you know, the rest comes later. So, yeah, uh, but, but leadership is truly about servant serving, right? Leadership is, is about getting people on the bus. How can we bring together all these people, right? In different art, in different, like, you know, lighting directors, artists, cameramen, like even in film or in television, that's what producing is. It's assembling the team, leading the team to create something together. And that is never a solo endeavor. It's always, you know, it's it always takes multiple perspectives and viewpoints, which makes it hard because it's a human system, right? That yeah. you're managing. That's really the trickiest part of producing is the human system that you are involved in creating together. Yeah. It's also the moment that you have to remember that the moment you veer away from creating art and you make it become about something like capitalism, like money, then it's over. Like you're not, you're not making art anymore. You're, you're just trying to make money. And, and I think the best things come out of, while yes, money is part of it. Like it comes out of it's a big part of it. <laughs> it's a big part of it. But like, you know, you have to keep that in mind because I I've seen a lot of artists change because they become obsessed with revenue. And then, you know, the the spark is gone. And then the product suffers or whatever the the art that they're creating suffers or the the festival that they're putting together, you know, things like that. So but yeah, that's so important. So how can they find you? How can people find you? How can they find Philam Arts? You know, if they're like, I yeah, so they can follow me on Instagram. I'm at G-T-O-N-G-I. You can also go to the website, philamartsla.org, and you can find information there. You could also follow us on Instagram at philamarts. Just follow along because we're always looking for opportunities to amplify Filipino artists. So if you're an upcoming artist, we have opportunities for FPAC where you can sign up to be on the discovery stage. And we're working with Ruby Ibarra's Bolo Music because they're, they're looking to discover talent at the festival. But really, it's about being in community with other artists. Truly, Don Mike, now that I think of it, you got to be there. Yeah. You got to be yeah. at FPAC this year. It's our 30th year. We just got, you know, I'm so excited because last night I got word that, you know, we got two other grants and grants mean, yeah, we, we got a grant from LA Port of Long Beach. Uh, we got a grant from DWP, the Department of Water and Power. So, you know, people can come to the festival with their water bottles, like all these little things add up to create a festival experience that just brings resources to the artist community. So I would love for you to see it and be a part of it. I'd love that. And well, on that note, thank you so much for being here and chatting with me here on Producing Well Asian. Like I loved everything you had to say today. And this won't be the last time that you're on the show. Okay? We're definitely doing more small group chats in the future. And, you know, there'll be plenty to talk about, I'm sure, down the road. And so I really appreciate you coming on. And yeah, thanks for coming. <laughs> I miss you, Don Mike. Thank you. I miss you too. Thanks for listening to today's episode of the Producing While Asian podcast. Our theme song was created by Luxstock. We're produced by Press Play Podcast, and the show is edited by Michael Santos Sandoval. If you have a moment, please leave a rating and a review and send any ideas you have to producingwhileasian at gmail.com. To follow us, stay updated, or to read our blog, visit www.producingwhileasian.com.